Hello, yes. such a beautiful day outside. Everyone's gotten a chance to enjoy some of the sun. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're gonna get started. Um, my name is Alyssa Ferron, and I'm the director and curator here at Dunlop Art Gallery. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it's my true pleasure to welcome all of you here in celebration of Marjorie Bocash, who is the winner of the 2024 Governor General Award for Visual and Media Arts. Congratulations. I'd like to do the land acknowledgement before we begin. I acknowledge that we are currently situated on Treaty 4 territory, the original lands of the Cree, Ojibwe, Soto, Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, and on the homeland of the Métis. We're so very happy for Marjorie Bocage on being named the 2024 recipient of this prestigious award. I came to know Marjorie's work primarily through Thomas Johnson, who's the curator here of Moving Image and Performance at Dunlop Art Gallery. He's had a long-standing, good working relationship with Marjorie. And in the short time that I've gotten to know Marjorie, what I've most admired about her is her drive and commitment to making work that is unapologetically for her community. In doing so, her work necessarily benefits all others. Marjorie's work compels me to ask the question of myself, who is this work for? Who is my work for? It is for my community, and in doing so, it benefits all others. Me and my team are so honored that you accepted our invitation to nominate you for this award. Thank you. We're also pleased to be joined by Erica Violet Lee, who following, hi Erica, <laughs> who following a reading of Marjorie's new publication, Leave Some for the Birds, will be in conversation with Marjorie. And afterwards, we invite you to join in the conversation and in the celebration. We also welcome our online audiences. Hello, online audiences. Everyone's okay. <laughs> So welcome to our online audiences if you're watching us at home or from wherever you are. There will also be the opportunity to ask questions at the end of the event. So if you have questions or comments, please add those comments to the comment field on the right hand side of your screen and we will get to those questions and comments at the end of the event. Before I introduce Marjorie and Erica, I'd like to thank many individuals and organizations that have contributed to this event. Chef Dickey, who's the sous chef caterer, who has brought these wonderful goodies that you see on the table over there. Thank you, Chef Dickey. Annabelle and the team at Penny University and Kegadon's Press for making the publication available. Jamie Ross, who is the co-producer of the artist portrait video that you'll see shortly. Also, the team, the small but mighty team that we have here at Dunlop Art Gallery and that consists of John Cody, Jesse Dishaw, Eric Hill, Wendy Peart, Thomas Johnson, Sarah Pittman, Aisha Mosin, Margaret Besai, Tai Sang, Shamim Agamina, and, and now for me to introduce our special guest. So first I'll start with introducing Erica. Erica Violet Lee is a Nahia Plains Cree author, poet, community organizer, artist, and scholar. Eric has worked with Ida Moore, 
the Canadian Youth Climate Coalition, and the David Suzuki Foundation, among others, in the pursuit of indigenous feminist freedoms. She's from Westside, Saskatoon, and Thunderchild Cree Nation in Saskatchewan. Represented by Cody Caetano at Cook McDermott Literary Agency, Erica's debut collection of poetry entitled On the Prairies We Will Live Forever will be published next year with Penguin Random House Canada. Welcome, Erica. And then our guest of honor, Marjorie Bocage. Marjorie Bocage is a two-spirit Métis auntie, filmmaker, archivist, and educator, a land protector, and a water walker. Born in Vassar, Manitoba, and now based in Saskatchewan, Marjorie was born to a large Métis family. Marjorie's life work has been about creating social change, working to give people the tools for creating possibilities and right relations. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I was telling my friends earlier, I feel visible. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm grateful to the Dunlop for always supporting my work. And I want to say hi to my family and relatives out there that are tuning in. My nieces are always wanting to know what's going on. So I said, well, watch me. <laughs> so, um, and this is my, my story basket bundle of my book, Read Some for the Birds. It's just almost a year old now. And uh, this is how it started. This is my burnt out uh, covers that didn't burn in the fire because I had all these journals that I burnt after I was done going through them. And actually these are some of the ashes. Because people were saying, are you doing your memoirs? I said, uh, no, <laughs> uh, memoirs are just lies you tell yourself about who you are. <laughs> so I said, these are the ashes from my journals, and I called them memoirs because that's kind of the, the, the rest, the rest, that's all that's left of them. Um, a lot of my journals were a place where I could put my thoughts and feelings down because I had nowhere else to put them. And uh, I didn't go back through them until seven years ago. I, and uh, I found some things in there that, in my journey for justice, because most of my life has been about questioning what's going on in one form or another. And I, I saw that I had written some poetry and other reflections as well as all the vomit that goes with the raw emotions. And I said, what uh, else is in here? These are life lessons that I've learned over and over again. Some of them I had to learn many times over. And I thought, well, maybe some of them can help the young ones that are coming up after me. Uh, that's who I mostly work with and that's who I mostly care about right now. And so I, I wrote this for them the future dreamers and warriors. And as it turns out, there are the ones buying my book. And it's really moved my heart to joy when that happens. And so um, I want to read uh, a couple of poems, I guess, but uh, some of my favorites, <laughs> if I can have a favorite. Um, this is Grandmother Spider. Courage, my sister, letting your dark shine bright, uncovering stones of history. I remember first woman, Grandmother Spider. She birthed herself from the dark void. It took a long, long time where she had nothing to work with except the power of her own thought. She dreamed her thought into substance, 
and as soon as she was born, she began to spin and spin and spin. She wove that sacred spiral upon which the universe was born. And that is the thread I cling to now. So, the, right next to it is the recipe for a good day. And I had fun making these recipes, and these are the ones that the youth enjoy a lot. But this is a recipe for a good day. One is ka, wake up, get up, make your bed, give thanks for a new day, wash your face, give thanks for the water, smudge, give thanks for your life, prepare food, give thanks for nourishment, set your intention, be present, moment to moment, stay open to surprises, give thanks for the gifts you receive, give thanks, give thanks, give thanks. And that's what I mostly feel today, it's grateful for all of you for being here, for my friends who walked with me along this journey of my life, <coughs> inspired me, scolded me, <laughs> cared for me. <laughs> all of the above, but that's how you grow. And since this uh, is event is also about uh, creating stories, changing the story you're living in if you don't like it. That's what I call social change. If you don't like this story, we can change it. How are we going to change it and make a new story? And uh, I found the magic, mystery, beauty for my spirit in film making. So this is a little poem, what I know about filmmaking. The first mystery is light. The visible coming into being. Light in time and space. Light shining on the power of authentication, not representation, with edges to look inside, to look beyond the frame, provoking, questioning, constructing meaning. To look and see, to rediscover, to salvage the essence of everything that overflows the outline of reality, of what remains within, after the film is over. Yeah. Another recipe? Yeah. <laughs> this is a, a, a good recipe asking questions. A work of art, this is a quote by Foucault, a work of art opens a void, a moment of silence, a question without an answer provokes a breach without reconciliation where the world is forced to question itself. And I think we are in this time right now more than ever. So this is my recipe. Take some vision mixed with imagination. Add the power to make things happen. Manage your state of mind. Go after what you really want. Focus your attention and let the story unfold the way it wants to. Ask yourself questions that empower you. What shall I create today? What is this day for? What am I looking for? Authority, where does it come from? What is my acorn of truth? Art cannot be removed from the heat and friction of human activity. It demands engagement and the ability to see through and beyond the image. I am finding my true north in developing an independent voice, a community-based storytelling. No formulas here, no ego recognition. I prefer small time, I say. But playing small does not serve the world. I must let my light shine. 
and let my dark shine too. I cannot change the game through confrontation. Practicing men's power games only makes me more subject to them. It's no win. I have my own power to command and control my world. I am a self-governing woman. Uh, I don't know how long I'm supposed to read. No. <laughs> but, uh, this is something I, I like to do. I've been trying out lately and it's kind of brought interesting results. As I pick a number, any number from one to 207, and I'll read it for you. 48. 40 what? 48. 48, okay. Oh, yeah. Be. 48 it is, it's for you. Okay. Make it good. I hope so. Well, it's called The Time and Place to Heal. I went to a place actually called Homes for Growth when I was in burnout in my first round of social activism and trying to make changes. And <clears throat> so, a big change in my life at this time. So this is from my children. I am at a threshold in my life. I don't believe, I don't belong in this religious lifestyle. So what is my mission in life? I travel deep within to where I've never been before in search of the sensuous mystic, allowing myself to feel. I also seek to understand how my bad experiences in the past have stunted my growth. How I am beside myself having walked around in the valley of darkness for too long. Settle in. I see that I don't need all my defenses anymore. <clears throat> Feelings are emerging and causing unsettlings in me. My body is the messenger. Cellular memories are being released as I move energy around through physical work. Physical manual work restores me and makes room inside, digging roots making a garden, chopping wood, peeling paint off an old building, baking bread, canning tomatoes, clearing whole field of quack grass by hand, and the walls come a-tumbling down. I have loosed my bonds. Trembling, I step out in awe before the gift arising from the depth of the earthquake in me, and my heart murmurs, thank you, where I was hurt most is where my truth was most denied. I follow the wire of feeling to see where the short circuit is that has been cutting me off from my deepest self. Do you like it? Does it fit? <laughs> first teaching that I didn't know was a teaching because we didn't sit around and get teachings we just lived them yeah. so this is called seeds on the forest floor <laughs> I wrote it in French but I also have the translation I'm also a French picture <clears throat> I don't know which one to read okay les bleus tout Tout bleu, toute mûre. Prends les potettes, ma petite. Prends les potettes. Laisse-en pour les oiseaux. Oh, les oiseaux. J'ai pris leur langue dans le bois. Leur chuchotement 
de chansons, des cantiques, des remerciements. Oublie pas ma tête. Je me souviens, ma mère. Je me souviens. Ma grandma. Don't forget where they come from. Leave some for the birds. That's the foundation for justice making in my life, mm -hmm. is those learned teachings I learned from living in the bush with my grandmas and fam extended family and living. The land taught me those things. Oh, that's enough now. Erica's turn <laughs> to talk to me. That's a good place to, to transition a little. All right. Can everybody hear me, see me? All right. Um, Tanse, Erica Lazuli, my name is Erica, and I'm so honored to be here today <laughs> to be able to see you. I'm going to talk to you. Okay. I'm so honored to be here today with Marjorie, um, who has been an elder that has influenced me extraordinarily. Um, coming from the inner city in Saskatoon, it's very easy to not be connected to our culture, even to the same extent, um, you know, with all the shortcomings and critiques of res life, um, I think, you know, it's kind of it's kind of like a grass is greener situation. <laughs> being urban, you know, there are things you, you think you're missing out on, and and then being on the res, as my friend had told me, um, there are experiences that are denied to you, um, and so. Marjorie is one of those elders who truly transcends boundaries that are that are so falsely made between those spaces, and that's something that I really appreciate about you. Um, and then, on our, just on our drive here from Saskatoon, we got in like five minutes before two o'clock. <laughs> um, I don't know where the time went. We were both like, "Is it twelve fifty already?" <laughs> so the time kind of got away on us. Uh, which is maybe a testament to the, the insufficiency of linear time uh, in our worlds and when we're in the same spaces together. Um, I think also you, you laid a groundwork that is another, another cross-boundary, um, crossing of boundaries that, and a, a distortion of boundaries. And a, you, can't, you can't hold me. I think the word you said in your poem was overflow. Um, so many of us as indigenous or native people, I use the term native because that's kind of what I prefer. Um, that's what we call ourselves where I'm from. Um, is the artist, activist, or organizer, whatever you want to say, artist, activist, writer, author, um, that those things that like we never have the luxury to sort of devote our lives to just one. We're like all of these things at once. We're educators and elders, and like learning, always constantly learning, um, always constantly running and moving just in, like it's our first time being alive, just like anyone else. But as Native people, we're not really allowed those spaces. Um, so I'm so thankful for your work, um, complicating those narratives, and speaking back to what we're expected to be as Native people, um, which is very unidimensional and very, um, I guess you're not speaking with the, the flowery, flowery language, right? When we talked about this on the way um, from, from Saskatoon, um, a lot of people think that poetry is pretty words. <laughs> they think, um, we talked about how poetry, in, in the senses that we write it, is actually just like how to convey feeling in, in a language that is hostile to us, that has always been hostile to us and our lives. Um, how to convey feelings that are, can't be contained by uh, any other type of writing, but it's more than just flowery words and funny like funny um, syntax, right? Um, and a lot of people who don't necessarily consider themselves poets think that way about poetry. Um, 
you 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 keep it to all like all, every word in every poem has a place, has a reason. Um, there's nothing. It's which is very Saskatchewan to me. <laughs> there's nothing um, that doesn't need to be there. Like driving through the mountains, that's beautiful and all, but like it's so excessive. <laughs> like really, do you need that? I don't know. I just prefer the prairie. I'm sorry. <laughs> Like, oceans are great, but I like a prairie. <laughs> Give me a flat prairie anytime. Um, so, yeah, that's, it's so Saskatchewan, and growing up, I like ached for that. Um, and Louise Half is here. I'm gonna call you <laughs> Louise Half, another, um, just the like legacy of Native women writers and, and fighting through so much, like having everything against you that Native women have in these societies um, to even write on the page and get it published. Like, holy crap, that's so much. It's so much for me right now in 2024. So like, I just can't thank you enough for the words you've given us. Um, yeah, is there anything you wanna say in response to that? Yeah. There's a lot of people that have worked hard for many years and decades to make spaces for young ones today, you know, in all the different art forms. And we did it because the future is coming and they need to have that place. So that sometimes it means you put your own stuff aside, right? Um, but it's worth it because you see what what's happening now, they're blossoming, you know? And they're buying a door. <laughs> you know, like, I, I, I could not have imagined things like that in, before for myself, but for them. You know, but we all did it together, collectively, in the 90s especially. The writers started in the 70s, the visual artists, they had their societies going along before anybody else. And, you know, so Scanna and Big Buffalo and all of those, <laughs> but uh, there's there's been a lot of history in in our community, art history that is not known and not taught at the university still. But hopefully, we we find different ways to share our stories. Cause story, what I come to now, story is medicine. That is the only medicine that can change this world. Whether it comes in a song, a poem, or a, or a painting, or a film, that's the medicine that the world needs from us to heal. Like, there is nothing else. There really is nothing else that will change the story we're in right now. We have to change the story we're in. I've been thinking about Gaza a lot and trying to, that story, if you think about it, is thousands and thousands of years old and there's not one person in this room that didn't hear about David and Goliath somewhere along the way. And David, and it's written down in that book, the Bible book, and that's considered the truth. David is the hero, that's their chosen land, their holy land, and it be, they're going to go there and, and that's their promised land. Meanwhile, Goliath is defending his homeland, the Philistine. Palestinian is defending his homeland, but his story is vilified. And that story has been passed on forever. And that's still underneath what's going on in Gaza in the long run and why every people are still not going against what Israel is doing because of that story that's so entrenched. That requires a paradigm shift. That's a paradigm for war, that story. Taking what's not yours, killing people for it, whatever. So, I've been thinking a lot about sharing stories and when we do that, we see each other differently and there's more than one story, even about what's happening here today. 
we each have a story and we each have a reason for being here and how we came to be here. And that would change our relationship if we shared those stories. I'm not the star. We're all here in this story right now. Yeah, my story is starting off this conversation, but it's not the only story. So, anyway. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> my drop. Um, yeah, um, it's, it's, so surreal and I'm so glad Marjorie has been one of the elders and community members in the native in our community who has consistently like immediately as soon as things started happening on October 7th and before that like you you knew what was going on um, and we've both been involved in Palestinian activism um, supporting Palestinian activists and people people just defending not even activism right that's why it's kind of I don't we don't like generally being called activists because what we do is standing just, up for yeah, what's right like living our lives puts us in these positions where we're forced to be on the defense and offense um, just to live and so uh, yeah I think that's so powerful and important um, and connecting our stories to um, so the, the whole reconciliation idea is something <laughs> you've been vehemently against as well. Um, turning, turning our stories and our lives into like fodder for you know, reconciliation in, institutions that do not want us really. It's the white thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we have to change that narrative. But that's what I'm saying. We don't need any more shame or, or, or guilt or anything because it still takes up all the space. So we need to have a different treaty, a different relationship, and that comes by sharing our stories with each other so that, so that to me, when that happens in a real honest way, then things can change. We can change our story together, but right now we can't do that because we're not uh, connecting. I think of that as coming to a conversation in good faith and it's so easy like to tell when someone is coming to you in good faith um, I had I was on uh, it was a conversation with the Sask Writers Guild with um, oh who was it? it was Solomon Rat I think um, and Solomon Rat is <laughs> like he's a legend a living legend, a, a Cree knowledge <coughs> keeper, who's just like extraordinary storyteller. He knows so much, I can't even fathom what he knows um, about Cree history. And someone like came into the chat and um, it was just like, you, you aren't even giving us any concrete actions to like, and um, you know, we can't really give the land back, give us something concrete. So I dropped my PayPal link in. <laughs> and I was like, here's some, here's some concrete reparations. <laughs> and she got so mad at me. <laughs> so I this like hate-filled email. <laughs> and I was like, we've been telling you like, the clearest possible ways. And this is something Marjorie does as well, does not mince words. Um, so I think it was, I thought it was funny when Thomas and um, Dunlop came to us to have this discussion. <laughs> because we're both positioned kind of similarly in our communities. Yeah. The Hellraisers, the like angry two spirits. <laughs> <laughs> the protocol breakers. Yeah, I have always colored outside the lines. I'm left-handed, <laughs> you know, come from the bush. I don't know, like, why is it so hard for people to make room for different ways of seeing and being? Like, that's the, the bottom line, really. <clears throat> and as soon as, like, to me, that's the job of artists and storytellers is to stand outside, look in, and I, I've seen my camera as a witness and also as a mirror. And sometimes you don't like what you see, but that camera has saved lives because it has been a witness and a mirror for people 
like in Labrador in particular, one example I can give you that uh, I was there for a year uh, teaching people how to make video to document their stories and lives for an environmental impact assessment hearing on the Boise Bay Nickel Mine. And the mine never thought we'd do anything. They, you know, they paid for the cameras and everything, which was great. And, and uh, we did, started to do something. They even hired a University of Manitoba sociologist to diss our methodology. And this was before participatory research was a you know, <coughs> common word. This was like in 1990. And um, they, there's a radio station or a television station in a, almost every band office. Some are still operative. Most of them are just green screens in the house playing music and putting messages like happy birthday or something. So that whole infrastructure is there. And uh, when I first went to a new country, I asked them what their origin story was, because every nation has one. And it's, well, theirs was Wolverine, but they, nobody knew the whole thing, that of the eight people that I was working with. So, I um, asked them that their assignment that weekend was to go home and find one of the old ones that would know the story and ask them for the story. Well, a few of them did and they, got, they recorded it and brought it back, but it wasn't complete. So then I, thought, I saw the TV screen sitting there and I said, let's plug it in, let's put it in the in everybody's house and ask people to, to help us with the story. So that's what we did. And the next thing you know, people are walking from their houses and they're all coming to the band office. You forgot this, you forgot that, <laughs> you know? And, and, and together, they were able to piece together that story. And, and um, when the camera went missing and the kids that were sniffing stole it, and we find that they, you can't go anywhere on Davis Inlet, it's an island, so you, it's on the reserve somewhere, in the community somewhere. So we gotta have the camera back. So again, we've made a plea to bring the camera back to the, to the band office that night. We won't uh, do anything to you, we just need the camera back to do our work. And the camera was back, and inside the camera, there was, they had filmed themselves. The youth had filmed themselves when they were all high and sniffing. And we put that on the family, uh, on the screens in every house to come and talk about, you know, changing that story. They asked us to, f to film funerals. They, they couldn't see themselves anymore because they had been so bombarded in 50 years since Newfoundland became a province that they absorbed all the impact of colonization in 50 years. And they were beyond themselves and outside themselves and they had to come back to themselves and the only way they could do that if they could see themselves. Like with those cameras, that's what they did with those cameras. They made that medicine to help each other with those cameras, and some of them are still doing them and left all of that there. That's the kind of work that I do, and that's what I'm most proud of. And I would accept, you know, uh, that recognition because of that opportunity to be able to do that. Do you guys want to say anything? <laughs> Ask questions, comments? I actually had a comment. I was thinking of a story that you were talking about, because I've been a writer all my life. Yeah. Sorry, I just want to I was thinking of oh, 
Yeah, just say about story. And Carry it on. It's one of those SM fifties. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was thinking about story and having the courage to change injustice and to change the story. And I do understand. Um, I mean, I guess through multiple generations, my people could be considered the colonizers or whatever. Um, but I, I do understand if, if, a, if a nation is hurt or a people are hurt, that there's a necessity to reclaim what was lost. But I also think that we're talking about stories today, what's relevant for stories today. Healing, healing is always relevant, and that's something we all have to do regardless of our background and what we've gone through. Because we've all, I'm sure, in this industrialized world, we've all experienced trauma of some kind. Whoever it was that delivered the trauma to us, or however it affected us. But I was thinking the story for today is not necessarily a story of distinction. Um, because I think if we continue to promote the story of what is distinct, we're actually promoting the extinction of the human race. I think that the story for today that we all have to write ourselves to and we have to align ourselves to, regardless of what our national background is or our cultural background is, is the story of uh, unity. Because unity is the future of the human race. And we can't allow past grievances we can't allow past traumas, which are still with us today, perhaps. And we all have to do our individual healing regarding those things. But I don't think we can allow anything to distinguish ourselves from a belief that we are all part of the same human race, that the future of the human race is the integration of ourselves, and the Métis Nation already knows about what it means to be integrated because of, you know, the multicultural background. Do you want to let Marjorie respond? It's been a while. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. We're just going to get some more questions, or maybe, or something mm -hmm. like that. We're all related, but we're not all the same. And that's... Uh, here, here. Mm -hmm. um, we're not... That kind of unity is the story that Canada tells itself about who they are. And Canada's story is only like, what, 150 years old? You know, like we, we have a whole lot more than that, that song of unity or we're good people, we're peace-loving people, we're all these things, and yet we're allowing the war to continue or we're allowing you know, injustice and all of that. So it's like those stories are the ones that we have to change, that the, everybody has to change. And not say we agree that we're all unity and we're all going to be, you know, what Canada says we are, because that's not true. Anyway, that's, that's my feeling about that. It's like we, can, we don't have time to be nice and to be trying to make people feel better about things. We have to change things. The world, the earth needs us. The water needs us. We have to be there to have a future for the next generations, that's all. And it's not by just being nice. Um, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know what time we're at, so can you give us a time check? Okay. More stories, comments, anything from people? <laughs> no. I have, I have a question. Okay. Tell me, um, tell me some of your biggest influences as either a filmmaker, an artist, an activist, someone who's living life for the first time. Hmm. There's so many. There's some right here. My grandmothers really were the foundation like for a lot of who I am. Uh, really miss them. My aunties, my sisters, like they 
we had that kind of relationship where we just understood each other. We could fight, cry, laugh, didn't matter, but we were still sisters. We were still cousins. We were still, you know, no matter what. And even when I'm being my worst, they all laugh at me, you know? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. In terms of um, story, like, I've been, like, Maria and I, and Alanis and Brunelda Wheeler, and the people uh, in film and video, and, and Joan Cardinal Schubert, and all the people that want, were helping to create a space for contemporary artists to work with old forms. That was a vision that inspired me the most. I went to film school, but I didn't have, there weren't very many people making films. I was 40 already. And uh, we had, I realized there's no place for us to make films. There's no money for us to make films. They don't think our stories are good enough. And I got mad. Uh, I had put aside my, my artist uh, self. I mean, my activist self, and I had started becoming a filmmaker, and then I realized it's the same damn thing in film and, and, and uh, media. So that's why we had to work so hard to create those spaces, and that's what inspired me, that all of us working together, because each one of us alone were having those struggles, but together we were able to make changes in all the arts councils, in Banff, in lots of places where we could then make our work and start to be seen and heard. So that's what inspired me was us doing it together. Still does. You know, we're, we've got a Métis collective going on now because we're trying to fit, find a place for Métis voice. Because a lot of the Galbis and, and uh, places are just for First Nations. And so, you know, we, we, we've always tried to find places that, where we can be who we are. Um, yeah, I think uh, let's, let's, let's take it out with a reading, if you're okay with that. Mm -hmm. You okay with that? another yeah. poem or two? Yeah. Is there anything in particular you want to? But is there people online that have questions? Yes. Or do you want me to read? I think we should. Okay. We listen to you. <coughs> listen to me. Okay, I am your holy freakness. <laughs> I wrote this one in Santa Fe after I had been burnt all my journals. I am your holy freakness. I came here to be raw and naked, to burn away the edges of 70 years of conditioning, keeping me from myself. I came to be a mirror to all your weird and hurting places because I long for one for mine. I came to hunt the old stories, the sly deceits, the bitter betrayals and fears, and to blast them all to hell and back. I came to bed down the dark nights of the soul, to wander into the depths of darkness, knowing the dawn will always come. I came to be messy and get messier without reactive defense, in the belief that we can disintegrate and mend again and again. In times of heartache and sorrow, I find peace in stones, in water, in fire. Where I come from, there are songs for tears and dances for rejoicing. Where I come from, there are also dances and songs for grief. There are stones and water and fire. Hey, come outside. The sky is clear. The wind sweeps you clean. The sun burns away illusions. At night, the shadows dance. Starlight enters. My eyes open. From cosmic dust and star song, I come. Pulled from the fiery bodies of the ancestors. Stacked wisdom in my DNA from cosmic threads, untangling star self, old forms of self-preservation slipping away, reaching out and back in, arriving from and to, 
I am stardust on a mission. I am your holy misfit, birthing elements of creation in the cosmic dance of justice making, bits of promise dust into us, keeping us engaged with the mystery of the ancient ones in this stardust soup we are in. Ancient, current, future matter, blended in time wrinkles, bending light, creating waves, rising from the black hole of colonial rule, dancing away in the stuckness remembered and then forgotten. I have made small stitches back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, until the holes in my heart were mended. A patchwork heart darned in the dark, lit by the stars. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, that is really who you are. We are stardust, made to navigate the light ways, to create beyond our reach into revolution. I wish I may, I wish I might, first star I see tonight. Yes, now the winds of change push us to turn this world around, connect the dots, tune in. The ancestors are live streaming all the time, future memories merging with predictions of the past. All we need to know is written in the stars. Listen for star song, Ami. Choose consciousness over denial, passion over apathy, truth over betrayal. Now is the time our Blue Mother needs us. One is God. Catch a falling star. Thank you so much, Marjorie. I just want to give another round of applause for Marjorie. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. This concludes our event, well, this formal portion of our event. Um, but please join us for the celebration and some snacks uh, provided by Chef Dickie, the sous chef. Thank you again so much for coming, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. All right. Good